So simple, so quiet. One note dragged across a violin string, putting your teeth on edge. Zimmer started something special in Batman Begins and then really outdid himself with the Joker's theme. You have any idea who you're stealing from? You and your friends are dead! Someone give William Fickner his own movie. That is all. He's out, right? To be fair, the Joker is no Sterling Archer. Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you... Stranger. I mean, I just... Has there ever been a better opening in a comic book movie in the history of ever? We learn so much about the Joker through his heist in barely over five minutes. He's a master planner who was able to keep his anonymity from all the guys he hired. He's specifically robbing a mob bank with a future plan in mind. He fears nothing, and above all, just from this nonchalant no-look murder, slight head tilt, absolutely bizarre response, and close up on his face, we know he is a man to be feared, and a villain to be feared above all other villains as he doesn't even subscribe to the adage, honor among thieves. And he's not above a simple smoke grenade fake-out gag. I told you my compound would take you places. I never said there'd be places you wanted to go. An underuse of my boy Killian for sure, but I'll never complain about seeing him. And good on him for showing up to give this universe continuity. Can't say the same for all actors involved. That's more like it. Also, Killian Murphy is always a win. Yep. This has to be the cleanest Batcave ever. No one leaves something like that up to chance. I don't. I make my own luck. Ah, uh, double mug shadowing. Hostile? I see you hostile! Ha! Reference to Harvey's original origin as Two-Face, where he gets acid thrown in his face in a similar situation. You want to kill a public servant, Mr. Maroney? I recommend you buy American. Get him out of here. But your honor, I'm not done. Also, badass good guy. For now. Fancy stuff for a city cop. Have help? I we liaise with various agencies. <laughs> various agencies. Did I mention Gary Oldman is always a win? What about that floodlight on the top of MCU? If you've got problems with malfunctioning equipment, I suggest you take them up with maintenance. You know, I think part of the story that people often forget is that while it maybe should have been easier to discover Batman's true identity, he was making life easier for most cops. Especially Gordon, who had access to all this tech and genius now. So why would they go out of their way to investigate him? It's one of those things they all probably chose not to think about. I'm sure Gordon always had his suspicions, but truly didn't want to know. Three buttons is a little 90s, Mr. Wayne. I'm sure he owns quite a few, in fact. You never know when chainsaw spray might ruin your clothing. Just be thankful he's not obsessed with business cards anymore. You want to be able to turn your head. It's sure made backing out of the driveway easier. Another amazing attention to detail from Nolan. Most directors would just upgrade the suit in between movies and expect everyone to just play along. And even the most hardcore Batman fans would just shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, that's what they do in superhero movies. Vader suit got unexplained upgrades, why not Batman? But Nolan actually brings back the original suit and then has Batman request the upgrades. Things like this are what separate Nolan from the pack. Rachel's told me everything about you. I certainly hope not. Not even Batman is above little ex-girlfriend snooping, new boyfriend intimidating. So let's put a couple tables together. I'm not sure that they'll let us. Oh, they should. I own the place. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. What a line. Two-Face shadowing his own fate while also imparting wisdom to Bruce he wouldn't truly understand until battling the Joker. <laughs> Oh man, you thought he'd already been introed. You thought wrong. No one will ever touch this bone chilling laugh. How about a magic trick? <laughs> it's. It's gone. Oh, murder jokes. Heath Ledger is always a win. May he rest in peace. I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. Also, it's amazing how something as gruesome as jamming a pencil into a guy's brain through his eyeball can play for laughs but still make you terrified of the Joker. And let's talk about the aesthetic of this Joker. He's filthy. His makeup is caked on and running from sweat, and you can just imagine that he and his breath smell terrible. Batman has no jurisdiction. Truer words. You're crazy. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'll let you have the freak comment. See, a guy like me... Freak. <laughs> but that's strike two. Also, this is so key to the Joker. He's not insane. He comes in laughing because he's mocking Lau. The laugh is a performance to inspire fear, just like his laughter when killing the fake Batman. I guess he may be insane, but he's totally in control and calculated at all times. Uh, let's not blow this out of proportion. Joker puns. Even in a universe where the Joker is the scariest dude alive, he can make puns threatening. You think you could steal from us and just walk away? Yeah. <laughs> Honesty. 500 grand for this clown dead. Strike three. Here's my card. Sorry, everything he does is a win. Love this pan around the three of them talking while Batman just stands there in silence. You 
sitting down there with scum like Wurtz and Ramirez. And, and I never noticed how much they set up the questionable nature of Gordon's men, but Dent mentions it almost every time he speaks with Gordon. Just a great way to set up their betrayal. The CIA had a program back in the 60s for getting their people out of hot spots called Skyhook. You mean Big Boss in the 60s. Should do fine against cats. You're talking Pfeiffer, Barry, Hathaway? All different levels of feline. It must be really hard to like Dent and want him to succeed so you can stop Batmaning, but also really just want to rub your life in his face and ruin every date he goes on with your ex. Tightrope walk. You want to know how I got these scars? Three strikes and you get to hear a story before you die. Why so serious? I love that it's revealed that this famous line was really nothing more than just a way to instill more fear and create a sense of anxious loyalty in his new goons. Why so serious? Also, just, yep. Sonar. Just like a uh, submarine, Mr. Wayne. I mean, or a bat? I'm Batman, you dumb fox. Batman in Hong Kong. Win. Batman jumping off a super tall building in Hong Kong. Win. Batman flying around Hong Kong when the music fades out and all you hear is the wind flapping in his cape. Win. That moment when you realize the Joker was right about Batman's jurisdiction. I wonder how far away Mother Base is from Hong Kong. Oh boy, looks good on the tube. <laughs> Gordon, you minx. Is that an Eminem joke? Do you ever wonder if Nolan said, all right, Heath, just, you know, tone it down like just a tad, and he turned to him and said, Look at me! And Nolan crapped his pants. I'm a man of my word. <laughs> and then I crapped my pants. Also, if you look up evil maniacal laughter in the dictionary, it's just this sound. <laughs> now, that's an entrance. Look at this face. This is the face of Gotham's bright future. That's half true, but only for a short time until you tackle him off a building. I only have one question. Where is Harvey Dent? What a performance. Very few actors can walk into a room and own it the way Heath did, combining intimidation with a jittery, unhinged yeah. evil. You know... You remind me of my father. Uh, compliments? Beautification by hair parting. I just wanted to know that I don't care about the scars. I stick a razor in my mouth and do this. And now we get the confirmation that he was just messing with Gamble. As the razor blade against the violin string pitches higher, we slowly start to realize that he's really not sane, and although you feel pretty safe he wouldn't just kill Rachel, you're not so sure anymore. And I super duper appreciate that Batman's fighting is more on screen, less quick cut in this film. They definitely up the editing game. You've gotta love that the Joker is excited to see Batman and can't wait to show him how his rules and Joker's lack of rules give him an advantage. Let her go. Very poor choice of words. Seriously, the Joker can't pass up a pun opportunity. Come on, Batman. Some men just wanna watch the world burn. And that's what makes this Joker so special. Just an agent of chaos. Don't tell me you didn't recognize your baby out there pancaking cop cars on the evening news. Finally, someone acknowledges the insanity of the amount of engineering and manufacturing that goes into being Batman. Obviously, for the most part, they're going to cover their tracks, but even the world's greatest detective and his helper guy make mistakes sometimes. What can I do for you, Mr. Reese? And you should have known that Mr. Rees would solve the Tumblr riddle. Ugh, you're thinking, all right, Batman's one step ahead this time. He knows what's going on. Ah, uh, nope, here comes Joker music. There he is! I'll get into the Joker's broader plan later, but this small section catches some black as well. How did Joker know that Bruce would find the fingerprint and end up in that room? He didn't. It didn't matter to the plan. Sure, he planted the evidence because he's crazy, but even he probably thought it was a long shot. The window shade is simply a distraction right before he tries to shoot the mayor. Bruce didn't need to be in there for that to work. And this is awesome, don't get me wrong, but is anyone tired of this image showing up in all those clickbaity links? Nightclubbing. Sometimes he's just so batman it hurts. I'm counting on it. Huh. Ah! Ah! Brutal. His name's Schiff, Thomas. He's a paranoid schizophrenic. You know, if he also had a disassociative identity disorder, he could technically be Kurt from Ant-Man, just with a new accent and name. You can't give in! Ooh, the first crack in his psyche is exposed. Joker's plan is on schedule. Endure, Master Wayne. Take it. I find it interesting that even though Alfred is always the one looking to protect Bruce, in this instance, he's the one giving Bruce the best advice. He's the only one that understands any concession to the Joker can't end well. It's as if Bruce can't even comprehend what the Joker actually is because he doesn't fit into his world of motives and control. Alfred gets it, having dealt with his kind before. I am the Batman. See, we know you're not the Batman because the Batman doesn't call himself the Batman.
Oh, I'm sorry, did you think this was going to be a Jokerless prisoner transport? Even in his diversions, the Joker likes a little wordplay. Fire? Truck? Eh? It's funny because the Joker loves to laugh, but apparently he likes to slaughter even more. <laughs> Great response. Saving all the good guys. Goodbye. Yep. And that's almost as good as having dormant nanobots in your bloodstream to restructure your anatomy and turn into a bat pod. That's not good. Okay, that's not good. Astute observations from the chatty guy who stole Chandler's hat. Everyone pretty much knows by now, but it still amazes me that they actually built the bat pod and it was completely functional, cape and all. And speaking of practical effects, holy crap. This might be my personal favorite moment of the Joker. It just plays into his carelessness so well. Finger on the trigger while he's stumbling to get up after a crash. He's so committed to chaos, he's willing to die just to ruin Batman. Though he knows he won't actually kill him. No. No, you. You complete me. Joker McGuire? <laughs> What is more terrifying than an antagonist that laughs harder the more you hit them? I love the way the bad pot accelerates as if it's one gear with no top RPM. So let's talk about the much maligned Joker's plan. It's its own meme at this point, but that's because for comedy's sake, people like to point out every minute detail as if it was planned by the Joker. Really, the first and biggest mistake everyone makes when judging the Joker's ridiculously perfect plan is thinking it was his only one. Just because the plan we see happens doesn't mean it was his first or even preferred plan. And it was simple. He knows Harvey's not the Batman, so he's going to attack his convoy knowing the real Batman will show up. Best case, he actually gets Harvey and then moves on to blowing him or Rachel up. Second place, he gets captured and has phone bomb guy as his escape plan. Clearly, he had getting captured as an option and was totally cool with it. Could you please just give me a minute? Or third is that Batman breaks his one rule and kills him, which he's also cool with, because chaos. He has loyal goons throughout the city ready to do one thing if he's captured or another if he succeeded. I know there will still be comments about the minutia of his plan, but before you comment, ask yourself, was it necessary to his plan? If it wasn't, then it wasn't necessarily part of his plan. No! Man, what a misdirection. At this point, anyone who's ever heard of Two-Face knows Harvey's going to be Two-Face. So the assumption would be that they rescue Rachel and Dent just barely escapes with half his face. And then we get Silence of the Lambs. Some... And then, no last words. Harsh, Nolan. Harsh. What do you think this is, Logan? And while Rachel's death is going to sting either way, the fact that the Nolans were able to make her a pivotal part of the plot as a large part of the force working against the mob and love interest for both Harvey and Bruce makes it sting all the more than if she was just an ancillary girlfriend. <sighs> and never has there been a more realistic and appropriate reason for Harvey to become Two-Face. But as your friend... I'm sorry, Harvey. Oh man, Batman, you thought you were doing something good, but you just built his hopes up only to be smashed into oblivion, really cementing that identity. And this silent sorrow turning into full-blown rage is so intense. What was that, Gordon? What were you saying? Say it! There he is. All you care about is money. Fully committing to the watch the world burn identity. Your plan. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? See what I mean? I mean, he's mostly manipulating Dent here, but there is truth to that. His plan is usually just to create disorder. I'm not a schemer. What is so amazing about this character is how much and at the same time how little we know about him, especially given how much he actually says in this film. We're given just enough information about the Joker to always feel uneasy and unsure of what he might do. The hilarious and nonchalant way he shows that he's let down by this little explosion not going off in succession. Do you have any idea how much whiskey would hurt in those open wounds? Dude's crossed a mental line, as if he actually revels in the pain now. As long as this machine is at Wayne Enterprises, I won't be. Commitment to your principles. You choose. The people on the other boat may not be quite so noble. Hey, Boltimatum? What an awesome way of setting up the geography of the building and showing us the immediate threats to Batman. I love how the hospital evacuation created a super typical cliche doctor hostage and clown villain video game scenario. <laughs> Saving cops from themselves. You have to love that the Joker has just adopted the dogs as his own and obviously they're loyal to their new alpha. It also nails home the metaphor of what the Joker is. 
One of the few wounds we see Bruce sustain in the series, other than, you know, a broken back and some knee trouble, is the dog bite he's stitching in the beginning. Then the Joker goes out of his way to parallel himself with the dog, like enjoying the wind on his fur. I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. And he clearly convinces Dent. The Joker's just a mad dog. I wonder who ever let him off the leash. So it's set up right away that he could make Batman bleed. I mean, come on, potential self-sacrifice. <laughs> Falling to his death, still laughing maniacally. This is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. What a line, what a character, what an actor. And what awesome camera movements as the camera spins around to change the Joker's orientation to right side up. I think you and I are destined to do this forever. And we would have watched you do this forever. Truly. I took Gotham's white knight and I brought him down to our level. The craziest thing about this entire movie is that the Joker's portion of this film ends with him winning. Not every battle, clearly, but he won the war. He destroyed Dent and turned Batman into a murderous villain in the eyes of Gotham. <laughs> Chance. Unbiased. Unprejudiced. Fair. I know I already talked about Two-Face's creation being almost spotless, but diving even deeper, chance, a flip of a coin is what determined whether Rachel lived or died. So of course this is who he becomes. Gary Oldman takes a back seat in praise for this film because of Ledger, but man was he amazing as well. Especially his desperation and how he feels that he failed Dent earlier. Dent is in there with him! We have to save Dent! I have to save Dent! And now his terror at the thought of losing his son. It's going to be alright, son. Lie. Like I lied. And I know I praise Zimmer for his part of this score, but James Newton Howard actually composed this building scene. Holy cow, does it always put me on edge. Amazing. I killed those people. That's what I can be. Image self-sacrifice. Or how Gordon famously puts it. Because it's the hero Gotham deserves, but not the one it needs right now. He's a silent guardian, a watchful protector. A dark knight. Yep. I get two comments on this channel more than any other comment. They are, I expected to see a 10 minute video of a blank screen with the word nothing. Or, why didn't you just upload the entire movie? Both top notch jokes, don't get me wrong. However, this was the first time while writing my script that I actually felt like I was timestamping literally every scene. Every scene from this movie is iconic. I'm not wearing hockey pants. It's a, an actual masterpiece. And I bet you can guess who I'm going to give a lot of credit for that classification. <laughs> every single time the Joker is on screen is perfection. He never misses a beat. J. Jonah is still the best cast of a comic book character because Heath reinvented, or I mean invented a character. Others will come along and do fine, maybe even great. You know I like Leto's take, but nothing will ever even come close to this performance. It's devastatingly sad that we lost him in whatever part his mental health and preparation for this role played in that. But he deserved the posthumous Oscar and I thank him for leaving us with this masterful showcase of talent and devotion to a character. Hi. A lot of you have probably heard this theory, nonetheless it warrants mentioning since I had a similar thought. The theory is that the Joker is actually some kind of war veteran suffering from PTSD. This statement, or a truckload of soldiers will be blowing up, nobody panics, is sort of out of nowhere. Sure, you could say it's a good example of society's desensitization to the normal horrors of our world, but it's oddly specific. And his other two examples happen in this film. Plenty of gangbangers are killed and people freak out when he threatens the mayor's life. So it's totally plausible that his scars are from being on a truck that exploded. Maybe he was the only one left alive and just couldn't cope. So he came back to destroy the establishment and introduce chaos to right the wrongs he suffered. He also seems very comfortable on the honor guard. So comfortable that no one even notices it. He's also proficient with a bunch of different weapons and explosives, is clearly an amazing strategizer, and says this. Ah. Never start with the head, the victim gets all fuzzy. Giving credence to the idea that he's been on one side or the other of some serious interrogation beyond just cops and perps. It's compelling, and I don't put it past Nolan, but I really, really appreciate it's not explained any further in the story. The Joker's empty history, lack of a name, it makes him the villain he is. The fact that the true story of his scars is unknown makes him so much more terrifying because what real event could be scarier than how our minds fill in the gaps? I sort of view the Joker as existing in a vacuum. I assume he inflicted the scars on himself and his self-creation was a response to number one, the lack of proper villains in Gotham, and number two, the superiority of the hero that is Batman. Nature finds balance. The Joker was that balance. Here we go. The way I see it, The Dark Knight is about choice versus chance, or control versus chaos. 
While Batman tries to control every situation and desires to understand his enemy so that he can make the right choice, the Joker strives to introduce chaos to make every choice seem meaningless. Batman chooses to save Rachel, but the Joker tricked him, rendering his choice irrelevant. I actually also think that there's a fairly good chance that each boat actually had their own detonators, or worse, since the Joker had only one, each detonator controlled both boat's bombs. The unstoppable force that is the Joker forces people to choose to expose something about their humanity, or in his fantasy, lack of humanity. What every single one of his victims doesn't realize is that their choices are meaningless. He will always win, even when he loses. Only way to stand up to him is to not play his game, but even that can end in your death. I keep throwing the word chaos around so much that it's sort of lost its meaning. The point is that he has no ultimate plan. His plan just goes on and on. There's no end game. With no goal in mind, how do you stop him? In fact, just to nail that idea home, once he'd won by every criminal sense of the word, he burned a forest down. That's what makes him so terrifying. Nothing Batman can ever do will not play into the Joker's hand because his goals can shift on a dime. <laughs> Everything about this film is amazing. The cinematography, the writing, every performance. It's a movie I will keep coming back to for years to come, even though it has some depressing subject matter. What's amazing about this film is that I just talked a lot about the Joker, and while I think he's the best thing to come out of this film, that's really saying something. Because this film is so well put together. Nolan made a four-act film not feel bloated. I know not everyone loved this interpretation of Two-Face and felt a little cheated, but for me, Two-Face was in the entire movie, just not in his final form. He's constantly torn between Batman's order and justice and the chaos and disorder that Joker is pushing him towards. Harvey Dent lost everything by making the right choices, indeed the sacrificial choices. There are actually some more hidden meanings in this film, but my friends at Wisecrack do a great job of tackling them. They dive deep into the duality and symbolism represented in this film. So check that out if you haven't already. And if you're one of my super duper hyper intelligent fans who caught the Rick and Morty reference in this video and want to hear more, they have a whole awesome playlist linked at the end of this video. Everything from Get Swifty to Szechuan Sauce to how geniuses Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland managed to tell the best stories ever, and all done in a really entertaining way. More links in the description. Anyway, this is about as hard as I can make this teaser frame. So good luck.